So far, I've talked a lot about the structure of language and how we acquire it. But I want to switch tracks now and talk about meaning. How do we make sense out of what people are saying? How do we derive meaning from language? The study of semantics grew out of philosophy of science and mathematics. Remember the formal languages? Remember the Chomsky hierarchy? This stuff all ties together. Formal semanticists are effectively doing a kind of mathematics called lambda calculus. This is what it looks like. I don't know about you, but this makes my eyes water. I am not a semanticist. And I find, <laughs> I find a kind of creeping dread come over me as I look over these Lambda calculations. Actually, I'm feeling a little bit of PTSD from my grad student days. <laughs> We're not going to get into this kind of stuff. We're going to go over some of the basics and some of the history about how philosophers came to understand what meaning is and what we mean when we talk about meaning. If you're really interested in this kind of stuff, then you can take a semantics class where you will do Lambda calculus, you will do a type of mathematics designed for extracting meaning out of sentences. One of the most foundational theories of meaning is from the philosopher Tarski. That's meaning as truth condition. Tarski would say a sentence like snow is white is true if and only if it turns out that snow is actually white, like in the real world. So if we were to go out in the real world and observe some snow and it turns out that it is actually white, then the statement, snow is white, is true. This probably sounds so obvious that I haven't conveyed any meaningful information whatsoever. At least that was how I felt when this was first presented to me. I thought, snow is white is true if and only if snow is white. Yes, yes, of course, that's what that means. And the reason this feels so trivial is because, I mean, it, it is sort of tautological. Because we're expressing it through language, we're saying the expression snow is white is true if snow is white. It feels a little bit odd to have to use the expression snow is white as a verification of the expression snow is white. It's a little bit hard for me to escape this l linguistic metacognition. But this is the basis for thinking of meaning as truth. Snow is white is true if and only if it turns out that in fact snow is actually white out in the real world. This may be more meaningful than it sounds at first because there are going to be some issues with how we think about this. One of the most influential philosophers in the field of semantics was Gottlob Frege. He was working in the late 1800s and early 1900s. He came up with a lot of the original formulations for thinking about meaning. And Frege made a distinction between force versus content. We can ask the question, is snow white? That has an interrogative force. It's a question. Interrogative force is just a fancy way of saying it's a question. Whereas the statement snow is white has assertoric force, which is just a fancy way of saying it's a statement. So you can have the same content, snow is white, is snow white, exactly the same words in a slightly different order. The only difference between these two sentences is that one is a question and one is a statement. They have different force. So they share content, but not force. Roughly, semantics is the study of content. We don't really care about force when we're talking about semantics. That's the realm of pragmatics. Pragmatists care about force. So the two sentences, is snow white and snow is white, they have different force, but they have effectively the same content. They have the same meaning. They both mean something about snow being white. The only thing that's different is how I'm using that content. Am I using the content to ask a question, or am I using it to make a statement? One of the most important principles in semantics is the principle of compositionality. The compositionality principle is a principle that constrains the relation between form and meaning by requiring that the meaning of a complex expression is built up from the meanings of its constituent parts and the way that those parts are combined. So one way to think about this is you can think about a sentence like John loves turtles. There's an asymmetry between John loves turtles on one hand and turtles love John on the other hand. Maybe John loves turtles, but they don't love him back. That's possible. 
The two sentences in this case are composed of exactly the same words. John loves turtles, turtles love John. But they have a different order. And so it's the structure of the sentence that causes that difference in meaning, not the words themselves. The same is true from the two lectures ago when we talked about structural ambiguity. John saw the elk with the binoculars. In that case, we have the same words even in the same order, but a different meaning because of a different structure. So the principle of compositionality says the meanings of sentences are a function of their structure. The meanings of sentences are a function of both their parts, the words they're composed of, and the structure those words find themselves in. But this principle doesn't always hold. There are some important counterexamples. You're probably familiar with expressions like kick the bucket, or killing some time, or raining cats and dogs. These expressions are non-compositional. You can't actually derive their meaning from the meanings of the words and the structure. Somehow we've mapped a completely different meaning onto those expressions that is very different than their literal compositional meaning. So an expression like kick the bucket does have a very literal meaning. You can use that phrase to express something like physically kicking a bucket if you want. But that's not usually what we mean when we're talking about it, right? When we say so-and-so kicked the bucket, usually it, that means they passed away. Same with when it's raining cats and dogs. I suppose it's at least in principle possible to rain cats and dogs. It would be kind of a horrific doomsday type scenario. Some exodus type stuff. But it's possible. Uh, I don't know if anyone has ever meant it in that way when it's used out in the world. Usually when we say it's raining cats and dogs, we just mean that the rain is really strong. It's not nearly as interesting or crazy as actual cats and dogs falling from the sky. So these are examples of meanings that are derived in a way that is not compositional. It's not just a function of the parts and their structure. It requires memorization. We have to remember what those things mean. They have specific meanings that you can't figure out just by doing the lambda calculus. But still, most expressions are compositional, so we can figure out what they mean, even if we've never heard them before. Like if I say Angela Davis was a social activist and professor at UC Santa Cruz, well, it's easy to figure out what that means by just the parts that it's made of. I'm talking about Angela Davis. She was a social activist. She was a professor. She was a professor at UC Santa Cruz. All of those parts together makes a meaningful sentence that means something, and that meaning is clear. But even if we stay in the realm of compositionality and we talk about meaning, especially meaning as truth value, there are some complications. Suppose I say something like, the morning star is the evening star. This is a very ancient reference, so I don't expect necessarily that everyone will have a strong intuition about what this even means. In the ancient world, there were two entities in the night sky that people referred to as either the morning star or the evening star because one of them would be seen in the evening and one would be seen in the morning. Pretty straightforward. The problem is that nowadays we know that actually both of those things are the planet Venus. So not only are they not a star, they are not different things. They are in fact the same thing. It's just two names for the same object in the sky seen at different times. So the question is, if I say the morning star is the evening star, is that sentence meaningful? When you hear it, are you learning something new? Well, you are learning something new if you thought that they were different things. Now you maybe will no longer think that. If you already know they're the same thing, it doesn't seem like you are learning anything new. Does this sentence have a meaning? Well, we can separate meaning into two components, sense and reference. This goes all the way back to Frege. Frege was the first philosopher who introduced this distinction of sense and reference. Sense refers to a mental conceptual representation of a word's meaning, how I think of it. Whereas the reference, and this may sound familiar, the reference refers to the thing in the world that the word refers to, the referent. You remember when we talked about mental representation, we talked about mental representations having real world reference. That's reference with a TS. So reference, C-E, refers to the reference in the world. Let's think about this with an example. Let's think about the word bird. 
Personally, I love birds. Uh, I have a bird feeder on my porch and I, especially I love cardinals. I'm not from the East Coast, so cardinals are a very mind-blowing phenomenon to me. Didn't realize birds could be that red. <laughs> it's very cool. But let's think about the word bird and let's think about what the sense of that word is. Well, the sense of bird is the set of mental representations that involve birdiness, right? So every time I kind of think of a bird, that's sort of the sense of the word bird. Usually that involves um, some kind of token that's like a prototype. So when I mentioned birds, you may have like immediately pictured one in your head. And it was probably something like a robin or a cardinal or a blue jay. It's less likely that you immediately thought of a penguin or a puffin or an ostrich or a cassowary. Even though those are all birds, they're a bit odd. They're not really prototypical birds. So we have a sense of bird. That's the way that we mentally represent birds. But we also have reference for bird. And the reference of bird is the set of all birds that exist in the world. So every bird in the real world is a referent of the word bird. So to see this in action, we can think about saying the word dog out loud. That word has a referent in the world, a real dog that really exists. It has a sense when we think of the word in our heads, when we think of what that word refers to, we have our own mental representation of dog. That's the sense of the word dog. This gets a little cloudier when we think about a word like freedom. We have a pretty clear sense in our heads of what freedom means, so we have a sense of the word freedom, but what about the referent? It's not exactly clear that we can point to something in the world that freedom refers to. It's more of an abstract concept, or a property, or a meta-property, actually. So what is the referent for freedom? This gets even murkier when we think of things that definitely don't have reference. Like an expression like largest prime number. That's a perfectly valid expression. I can put those words together in that order. And I may even have a sense of what that means in my head. But it absolutely does not have a referent. There is nothing in the world I can point to and say, there it is, that's the largest prime number. Because in fact, there's no such thing as the largest prime number. At least we don't think. There is no upper limit to how large a prime number could be. So this is a case where there there not only isn't a referent, but there cannot be a referent. Mathematically, there can't be a referent. So some expressions have a sense, but no reference. We can have mental representations of things that don't actually exist in the world, like unicorns, or Superman, or Santa Claus, or the Queen of the United States. Of course, the United States does not have a queen, unless we count Beyonce. But we don't have a queen in any official capacity. So, although you can't point to anything in the real world that those expressions refer to, there's no referent out there in the world, they still feel like they have a meaning. We still have a sense in our heads. We can also have expressions that share a referent but don't share a sense. So right now, Joe Biden and President of the United States currently refer to the same person. They have the same referent, but they have different senses. There's a sort of a different mental representation associated with Joe Biden than the President of the United States. Because President is a role in our government that Joe Biden just happens to currently fill. But Joe Biden could resign tomorrow if he wanted to, and then Joe Biden and President of the US would no longer have the same referent. They would refer to different people. So then they would have different senses and different reference. So then what is meaning? I feel like this is just getting murkier and murkier. Well, really, there are two schools of thought. There's externalism, which in the past was the standard view coming out of the Harvard philosophy department. It was proposed by people like Quine and David Lewis and Hilary Putnam. Externalism takes meaning as reference. So the meaning of an expression is equivalent to the referent that that expression refers to. So then meanings are aspects of our shared environment. Meanings are mind-independent things that speakers can coordinate on 
it's what the word refers to. We can all agree what the word refers to. We can point to it in the world and say, there it is. That's the meaning of the word. So I think there's something very attractive about this account because it gives us something very concrete that we can point to in the world and we can verify and we can say that is the meaning of the word. And it does something else for us. It gives us a very attractive theory of truth. If you care about truth in the capital T sense, capital T truth, if you take meaning as referent, then we have a way of assessing capital T truth of propositions because we can point to things in the world that those expressions refer to and we can find the ground level truth. Okay, contrast this with a different school of thought, internalism. This actually has a very long history, starting with Aristotle, going through William of Ockham, the uh, Ockham's razor guy you've probably heard of, um, Leibniz, one of the guys that invented calculus at the same time as Isaac Newton, and even Noam Chomsky. And internalism takes meaning as mental representation. This is meaning in a very individualistic sense. Meaning is for me. Meaning is equivalent to whatever my mental representation for a thing is. Here, we're not going to be able to assess capital T truth of propositions because we're not going to necessarily point to something in the world and say, that's the meaning of this expression. Instead, I'm going to point to my own mental representation and say, this is the meaning of the expression. The meaning is personal. It's what I meant when I said it. So this is very different from externalism. Externalism says the meaning is the thing in the world. Internalism says, no, we're not going to agree on that. So we're just going to go with the meanings are what I intended in my head. It's my own mental representations. I think this makes a certain amount of sense when you think about the fact that we don't really have direct access to the world. I've said this before, but really our only experience of the world is one that is internally constructed inside our own minds. So it makes some amount of sense, at least to me, to think that the meaning of a word that I say is my own mental representation of that word that maps to that word. Of course, that's what I intended when I said the word. I'm referring to my own mental representation because I don't have direct access to the reference in the real world. Suppose we take meaning as reference. There are a few wrinkles here. Let's take a classic example, Superman. A man with two identities. On the one hand, he's Clark Kent, the Iowa farm boy and mild-mannered reporter. On the other hand, he's Superman, a super-powered alien powered by Earth's yellow sun who is essentially invulnerable. Seem like two very different entities, but actually they're the same person. Just two different identities for the same person. Two different labels for the same referent. Let's suppose Lois observes Superman doing something extremely heroic. If Lois says Superman is a hero, does Lois also believe that Clark Kent is a hero? If you say no, I don't think so. I think she only believes that Superman is a hero. Then it must be the case that meaning is not just reference. Because if meaning boils down to reference, then when Lois Lane says Superman is a hero, she is also saying Clark Kent is a hero. If you hear this scenario and you say, yeah, she actually does believe that Clark Kent is a hero, she just doesn't know it yet, then you might be an externalist. Because the meaning of the expression is all about the referent, not about what she intended, not about her mental representation of the referent, but the referent itself, the object level reality in the world. If you think that maybe Lois Lane can have separate beliefs about Clark Kent and Superman and that the statements she makes about both of them can be true, then you may be an internalist because we can't resolve that meaning by calculating it over reference because the referent is the same. She cannot believe both that Clark Kent is not a hero and that Superman is a hero if both of those are computed over the same referent because it would be contradictory. 
So in order for the, both of those to be true at the same time, we have to say that the meaning of those expressions, the meaning of those propositions, is being computed not over the referent, but over her mental representations. And her mental representations for Clark Kent and Superman are very, very different. She views Clark Kent in a very different way than she views Superman. They seem like really different people according to her mental representations. Okay, let's do one more thought experiment to try to elucidate whether we feel externalism or internalism is a better model for computing meaning. This is called the Twin Earth Thought Experiment. And this was created by the philosopher Hilary Putnam. Hilary Putnam says, imagine two planets. Imagine Earth, the one that we live on, and then imagine another planet, Twin Earth, that is identical in every possible respect except one. There is one major difference between Earth and Twin Earth. On Twin Earth, water has a different molecular structure. It, it's functionally the same thing. It's that clear, translucent, bluish stuff that makes up the oceans and that people drink and is required for biological functioning. It's a universal solvent. It has all of the same properties and people use it in the same way. And you can maybe imagine that we're in the past, like maybe it's the year 1750, and we don't actually know what the chemical composition of water is. So for us, they appear to be the same identical thing. Now the question is, when we refer to water on Earth, when we use that word water, and when people on Twin Earth use the word water, do those two words have the same meaning? Now the issue is they are definitely not referring to the same thing, right? They have different reference. Water and then water on twin earth are actually different substances. If they were to discover the chemistry and figure out that molecular structure of the thing that they call water, then they're gonna know that those are different things. So the question is if they do figure that out, do you think that that would change the meaning of the word water? Or did those two words always refer to something different? that they always have different meanings. Does the issue of whether they mean the same thing or different things rely on what the people know about the substance they're referring to? So this thought experiment is meant to get at whether you're a semantic internalist or a semantic externalist. You have to evaluate your own intuitions. Do you feel like the word water has the same meaning on Earth and Twin Earth? If you do, you might be an internalist. Because what matters is your mental representation. And if you feel like it's referring to the same thing, if it is for all I know, if the mental representations are essentially the same, then that's what matters. The words have the same meaning because the mental representations are the same. But maybe you think water means something different on Twin Earth because it refers to a different thing. And if so, if you have that intuition, then you might be an externalist. What matters here isn't what people think it is. What matters is what it actually is. That's what the word means. So this is a question about what we think words and expressions mean. Internalism is a kind of functionalist semantics in some sense. If the words are used in the same way, if they map to the same kind of mental representation, then we say they mean the same thing. We're describing meaning in functional terms. But externalism is a kind of physicalist semantics, right? If the words have different reference in the physical world, then they can't mean the same thing. They have to have different meanings. It's kind of like how we think about mental states. Do you think mental states should be defined in functional terms? Or do you think they should be defined in physical terms? We get the same kind of distinction here. Do you think that meaning should be functional, referring to our mental representations and the way that we use words? Or do you think that it should be physical? Should it refer to specific things in the real world? One of my semantics professors once told me that meaning is the process of computing a referent. So what do you think? Do you think he was an internalist or was he an externalist? If meaning is the process of computing a referent, does that put you in the internalism camp or the externalism camp? And what about you? Do you think of sentences as having meanings dependent on objects in the real world? Or do they just refer to the representations in your head? Are you an externalist or an internalist? I think it's an important question we shall ask ourselves.
And I try not to bias you with my own thoughts on this, but I probably have already contaminated your minds. It's inevitable. Some key concepts from today's lecture. We talked about meaning as truth condition. This is the Tarski approach. How can we evaluate meaning? Well, meaning is just truth condition. Sentences are true if the thing in the world is true. We talked about the principle of compositionality, the idea that semantics is built on structure. We can determine the meaning of expressions, the meaning of propositions, the meaning of sentences, based on the words they're composed of and the structure that they find themselves in. We talked about the difference between sense and reference. Sense being a very internal mental version of meaning, and reference being the external, the referent in the world, and both of those being important and separable. And we talked about externalism versus internalism, this ongoing debate about whether we should conceive of meaning in physical terms, in terms of reference in the world, or whether we should think about it in more functional terms, in terms of mental representations, individualistic, speaker-specific meanings.